It's always a loaded journey being late to a shared experience. Whether it's movies, travel, TV, games, this really goes for any hobby where you can hear from at least one other person who has enjoyed it before you. And if that person didn't enjoy it, well, it feels like you're, you're likely to hear a lot more, at least on the internet. When you start something that's been out for a while, it's, it is so easy to absorb everyone else's thoughts, their opinions, their hot takes, and develop expectations. A couple months back, my buddy Kyle and I, well, we started Final Fantasy XIV's second expansion, Stormblood. Now, video first content is a new thing for me. I, I came from audio podcasting, so playing through Final Fantasy XIV is my first real experience playing through a game, start to finish, publicly. And playing through this game via videos and streams on this YouTube channel means I have now absorbed more hot takes before playing Stormblood than anything I have experienced, played, or watched in the past. When you've seen thousands of comments on a subject, you cannot help but simplify the messages down to repeated patterns that you notice. Before Heaven's Ward, it was pure, unadulterated excitement for Kyle and me to make it to what many Final Fantasy XIV players consider their favorite expansion. But in the case of Stormblood, the messages we received, they read more like warnings. An attempt to manage our expectations. Stories of a slow intro. Intros? Of, of characters we may not love as much as the cast of Heaven's Ward. Of a story that gets good? We promise it gets good. But not until the point one patch content and beyond. These are the messages that became patterns out of the massive number of comments and live chats that I read in our lead up to starting Stormblood. We've now made it to the end of 4.0. Our first set of credits for Stormblood have rolled. So now that we've played it, Kyle and I are gonna sit down and have a chat to try and figure out if 4.0 Stormblood is worthy of how many warnings precede it. But where did we leave off? When last we left Kyle, uh, we watched Gosetsu die, question mark? And Doma Castle fall, and we leave Kugani, and uh, yeah, we pick up with Kryle being captured by Fordola. There was also an opportunity there because, like, he kills the one commander, all Darth Vader style, but technically that was a Doma commander, so it's not like there's an opening. So Fordola gets promoted in order to help maybe motivate the others? And be like, see, you're all useless. I'm going to raise one of our locals to be in charge of things here. Yeah, it, it seemed kind of like right place, right time, right? And if you no longer have Doma, uh, all focus has to happen on Girabania, right? We see Xenos, we see Fordola. Like, the, the Empire is in a state of, like, unrest. They're feeling antsy because, I mean, they just lost Doma. Doma has, we, we succeeded. We, we had a major success it didn't feel like it because of the loss of Gosetsu. We accomplished what we went to the East to do. So it makes a lot of sense that, you know, we're picking up here, heading towards the end of 4.0, focusing on how Xenos and his band of Imperials are reacting to the fact that they just suffered a really crushing defeat. It seems like grasping gets strong, but Xenos still feels calm and collected at this moment. It's very hard to get where we leave Xenos out of my mind, which does not feel calm and collected. But in this moment, I remember thinking, he doesn't seem too bothered about the fact that he just lost an entire nation that was under his care. But he also left Doma directly after fighting us and realizing we had some potential and he wanted to foster that and let us live. So the fact that we were victorious in Doma 
while he might be frustrated with his own generals, means that things are proceeding as he planned. He wants the great battle with the Warrior of Light to happen. And this is going to give him that climax he's looking for. Yeah, Xenos is a very, very, he's focused inward. And it's something that's a picture that comes very, like, more and more into focus, just the further down this rabbit hole of Xenos we travel. Like, yeah, he's in a place of leadership and he is the leader of this occupying force in two very geographically far apart nations. But at the end of the day, he just wants a good fight. I would almost say it's to his detriment, but he, it, it makes it so that he's not all that bothered when things go poorly for the Empire because he seems only somewhat interested in that. He's more interested in this pursuit of a worthy fight, which I like about the character, but it makes him, I guess, like untraditional in a way. Because I, when I think like Empire and this is the son of the Emperor and he's in charge of these two nations, he's, he's all, Xenos is all about Xenos. I, I don't look at Xenos killing a killing a general and being like, ooh, Xenos is mad. I'm pretty sure Xenos kills generals just for fun. No, he treats people like a commodity and like cattle. And to have that perspective, you might need a royal bloodline backing you up. The bizarre thing about this conversation, I think we're both feeling it, is that Stormblood was purposely messy to convey war and politics. And knowing what we know now, at the end of 4.0 paints everything in a very different light. For instance, is Xenos upgraded at this current time when Doma falls? When we fought him in Doma, was he resonant, eyes aglow, inside, and making plans based on his resonant abilities? Maybe. I'm not sure when the upgrades happened. Clearly, he's a little confident in them because he gets right to giving it to other people. The other thing that they're portraying is the unknowns of war. And I think that's a noble cause in a storyline. This would have been way more clear if Raban was sitting there and he's like, generals, we need to go step one, step two, step three. We're going to go to this castrum, that castiellum, this castiolum, and get them all knocked out in a row on our way to Alamigo Prime. But instead, we took each of these in bite size. We said, okay, who knows what's going to happen after we take this first castrum? All right, we did it. What's going to happen after we take this next? And we inched our way across the land like you do in war. Right. And the fact that we have two Castellum assaults in pretty rapid succession uh, really worked for me because, the, you know, the first one, which is this is where we're kind of coming back online with the Girabania story coming back from the east after we leave Kugani. You know, Conrad's got his, he's, it's back to the table. Time to talk to Raban. Conrad's here. It's time to plan a resistance assault. First one is Castellum Velodina, which it's this whole kind of like, it's, it's more about the psychological victory. They want to, you know, replace the banner. It's really the only goal is like sneak uh, Monago up there on her griffin and just replace the imperial banner with the like the local Alamigo banner, just for the that that morale victory. Not just replace though, use glamour prisms, thereby putting them <laughs> in the lore and the storyline to enchant the banner. So you know they pulled a fast one using fashion. I like that they go as far as talking about how big the banner is and how cumbersome it would be to like, no, nah, nah, that thing, it, would, it weighs hundreds of pounds. You're, we're not going to be able to quickly, they just glamour it. Monago just goes up there. No, I'm a glamour enthusiast. I'll get on my griffin. I'll get up there. We got this. Yeah, it's a nice in-universe use of, of, of well, in-universe devices. But and it mostly goes off without a hitch, right? Like we route for Dola. In, in the opening moments of this, this return to Girabani, and it kind of feels like things are going well. There is a very large part off here, which I think is essential and leads us to our Minfilia crystal business down the road. Are you talking about the, the, the snake ladies, the Lady of Bliss? Exactly. Okay, because in retrospect, having now completed 4.0, I almost deleted these cutscenes. Like, it felt like we shouldn't even take the time to talk about this because there's too much other stuff to talk about. This doesn't seem important. I'm sure it is because you're super into the Echo stuff. I mm -hmm. I tune out. I'm here for the character interactions. I'm not as into the magic lore. 
in the moment, because we had done so many smaller quests, I was just excited to fight a primal. We're meeting up with the snake people. They're acting real distressed. Oh, the beastmen are under distress. Here comes the boss battle and they're always so awesome. So I was just stoked. Like I was hardly listening <laughs> when, when everyone was going back and forth about the plight of the brood mother. I felt kind of bad after the fact because I'm just like, mm hmm, mm hmm, get to it. Get to where she got pissed off. Why'd she get pissed off? I don't particularly care right now. Just give me that sweet boss battle. I want to see it. I want to see another primal done. And with the newer graphics and the mechanics and all that sort of thing, I just want to see it. Let's get into it. Well, unfortunately, Kyle, she's just a person. I'm not sure if there's like a snake person under the robe or not. It doesn't really matter. I, I think this is the first time where references to other Final Fantasy games, which I'm not particularly privy to, seemed really ham-fisted. Which it's like a throwback to a retro like model for a primal in an older Final Fantasy game. And it's just like I was expecting something monstrous and visually intriguing that plays to this tribe of snake people. I don't know why they're worshiping a, a just a regular ass human lady who happens to be a primal. Well, it's the Lady of Bliss. And I think snakes have always kind of been like sexy adjacent. Mm. So it kind of it kind of worked for me. What's more important and why this happened right here, I believe, is because we're building up information we have to know by the time we get to Shadowbringer. Well, boy, I'm glad you're here because I don't retain any of it. A, a mom was mad her daughter was dead. That's all I remember. It plays into the lore of the land and makes the Garleans more evil in some ways. For Dola the Butcher is running away. And while she is fleeing the Castellum Velodina, she runs into the Qualiana snake people who come out and are like, hiss, you said that this was going to be a peaceful land. You took my daughter hostage so that we would all live in peace. Give my daughter back right now. Your keep is fallen. I want my daughter. Okay. I remember the story. What's important lore wise? The game didn't get to the point. I would like you to get to the point, Kyle. Okay. <laughs> Hang on. Okay, 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 okay. So... So in the confusion, in the madness, the daughter gets struck down. The brood mother in her lament was surrounded by crystals because they happen to have them because they were making statues and stuff. Summons forth the Lady of Bliss, Lakshmi. Brood mother pleads to Lakshmi to bring back her daughter. And she does as a empty vessel, a shell of what she was. The body exists, but the soul cannot be returned. That's the new information that primals can bring back Empty bodies. Enchant dead people, maybe. Okay. Maybe make zombie warriors for some future thing. That could be kind of interesting. Okay. Okay. You've piqued my interest. Uh-huh. Which uh -huh. this didn't in the moment. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to pull the cat out of the bag right now. Litibus takes off his mask. Emperor gets all offended. What do you think his face was? Xenos? I think a little bit. Climbed inside of Xenos and now wearing Xenos. But he's not thick. A little bit still has a tiny flat butt. Xenos got some junk in the trunk, man. No, we don't know if that's like a bodice or like a construct of his armor. And yeah, he's a little short and like he wasn't suddenly taller. It wasn't voice acted though. And if he showed up talking like Xenos, you know, yeah, but you're kind talking of a primals. Elidibus is an Assian. Or, Assians don't have one to one primal powers, or at least that hasn't been established yet. Maybe they do. Maybe we'll find that out down the road. But an Assian climbed inside a Thancred, and maybe now we can establish that all the Assians actually have no bodies. Well, actually, the, the one came, Sideburns came back, like re-enchanted his own body there, even though he died briefly. You know, it's not a perfect theory. You're on to something, man. There, there's, there's something here that I didn't think about, which is just the inhabiting of bodies. Well, if it, is, if it does turn out to be Xenos, as you said, it's not pretty. I don't know. But like, uh, until that... <laughs> It's like maybe there's a dichotomy of primals inhabiting empty shells and Assians inhabiting soulful beings. Because Thancred was still Thancred. Thancred wasn't dead and Thancred is back with us. Thancred's soul was still intact when he was essentially possessed. Well, I'm right. And then that's where I feel like I have to replay through A Realm Reborn to see, like, was Thancred, was it kind of like a... <laughs> was it a yerk situation from Animorphs where the Assian was pulling memories from Thancred to act like Thancred? Or was Thancred allowed to like come out of his shell and like pretend to be himself for a time and then was repressed inside? I don't really remember the intricacies of how Thancred felt after he was Assian free. 
I can help you. But okay, all right, all right. You sold me on the importance of the Lady of Bliss. That does seem like an important factoid to stow away in the back of my brain as we march towards Shadowbringers. Second important bit of information is that we have additional powers. And this was using our Echo as a shield to save our friends from the enthralling blast. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot about that too. I really like the way the game advances your Echo powers along with your level. Like, obviously our level is going to go up, but oftentimes in RPGs, the game can't account for that. The game doesn't know that you've specced into this and that, and often games don't even know what weapon you're currently wielding when you enter a cutscene. They can't represent every job and how you're getting more powerful with the story, but every Warrior of Light playing solo has the Echo, and we get to see the Echo evolve and grow as we grow in power. And so getting to see a brand new Echo-based ability here really excites me for what's down the road, particularly again when we get to Xenos and his little speech about it. Well, let's get to Xenos or back to Xenos. Let's get back get back to Girabani, Kyle. I guess we're still in Girabani okay. for this, but we're, okay. we're talking yeah, so, Echo so and stuff. It's a great fight. We'll talk about it on a wall of trials. Really fun it's business. It's an okay fight. It's probably Big my lady. least favorite primal. Oh, damn. Oh, damn. It's boring, man. There's dancing. It's just a dancing. human. It's just a person. Bliss. Also, Scion's messed up. I have my final point here. Should have killed the Blurred Mother. Like, that is that is Scion 101. Why'd we let her go? That's just silly. Yeah, they're in thrall. They're going to go make more Lady of Blisses. You got to have a reason to do the extreme trial? So, we learn what they want with Kryle. We get a scene with Xenos infusing Fordola, or as our chat likes to call her, Florida Woman with Kryle's Echo. We meet the mad scientist. It looks like an evil version of my player character. <laughs> yeah, the mad scientist didn't seem like he was long for this world because he was made in the player editor, right? It's that old problem with all RPGs. When they don't show up with a custom model, you're like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what? I mean, you can just like make a Papalemo, right? Papalemo doesn't have a unique face. Oh, it means he dies? Yeah, exactly, exactly. L listen, in the grand scheme of things, the, the Mad Scientist was not the most important character, but he needed to exist. You needed, like, some character that was in charge of this twisted Garlean tech. So he served a purpose, and he only shows up, what, th in three noteworthy scenes, including the boss fight against him? True, true. I really like this scene because Fordola showcases her resolve, however desperate and twisted it may be, but Xenos looks her in the eyes, which at this point he hasn't been very keen on. And oh, look, oh, you're something. right. Yeah. When he's holding Yatsuyu by the hair and he's, you are so beneath me. I will talk to the ceiling. Exactly. But this one, he picks up her face, looks her in the eyes and, and is kind of building that violent speech he's going to do. He sees, he sees something in her, even though she's failed. Yeah, the whole, like, infusing for Dole of Kryle's Echo, it's just, it's messed up, man. I was so worried about Kryle this whole time. Like, it, it made me realize how much I've really bought into the character. Like, how, how much Kryle has wormed her way into characters from this game that I really like and really resonate with me. When, at the reveal at the beginning of this, when, when they revealed they've captured Kryle, I was just like, no, you, oh, you did not. You did not. First, you cut down... Yishtola, and now you've captured Kryle. I was not okay with it. And it really got me like fired up and I wanted to take the fight. And I was glad that the game was then, all right, let's 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 get to fighting. Let's take some Castellums. So the war advances. The resistant forces, along with the Eorzean Alliance, aim to take down the Specula Imperatoris, the Spatula. The Spatula, yeah. An another keep. We set our eyes on the next keep uh, after our first like resounding victory. Uh, and this is where Stormblood gets dark again. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're off the, off the, the Doma castle sadness. And here we are with, uh, the Garleans firing on their own men during this assault. Like while we're there, we're there assaulting it. The resistance is there along with, you know, Aorzean allies and, uh, they just bombard everything, which ends in, in Conrad dying. This character that's been seeing us through the Garibani front through all of Stormblood. And also, like, right before this, we had a really touching scene with him where he talks about how he believes in Lise and wants Lise to lead the resistance. All right, and he has us go around, talk to the people we previously did. We see how they <laughs> affect their lives and all that sort of thing. Like, Had us yeah, go do some Stormblood, ask Stormblood stuff. Exactly. You know, Conrad, he's spent. Kryle, not spent yet. Conrad, he'd done his duty. He's ready to move on. He's going to pass on the torch to Lise. 
It was a touching scene. It greatly affected Alphano, who really wants war to be this pretty thing. And instead, it's messy. Alizé getting all concerned about Alphano. Like, there's some really nice kind of scion team building that's in here. Yeah, Alphano, is a, he's such a strategist that, uh, like, I think he, in a, his most aspirational is like, let's wage wage war without bloodshed. Like, let's outthink, outplay, and out politics our enemies. But reality, the situation is that you, that can't happen. There will be bloodshed, and it, it, it clashes with... I think his ideal worldview, which I really like. I liked watching Alphano. It's it, it's a mean thing to say. Say like I I enjoyed watching them put Alphano f- through the ringer, but it, it's something that Stormblood I think does over and over again. And it it may seem small in scale compared to something like Heaven's Warden. I think that's where a lot of players find friction with the story of Stormblood. But it really paints I, to me a surprisingly nuanced picture of war. Like it, it constantly reminds you of how horrible it is and how there is no pretty decisions to be made, that there's always these unintended consequences and all of this unexpected and unintended loss on top of expected loss. So it's, I don't know, Stormblood's weirdly mature for an RPG. I think it's that randomness that no plan survives enemy contact, the realities of war that can make this hard to follow because after they fire on their own people, which is a big moment, another game would say, to the main base, like we need to defeat them because they're bad, they're evil. Instead, we have to go back to the table and think about it, which is what you'd actually do because you don't know if that cannon is still operational. If that cannon could fire again, could you not even approach the next base because that cannon exists? We saw a cutscene of Estinian being a badass and taking out the cannon for us. He's got his own little B-plot in the background doing all the sort of Batman stuff that we're not taking care of. I want, like, of. a Final Fantasy XIV standalone game where you just play through Estinian's story. Like, kind of the modern Final Fantasy games that are these more action-oriented RPGs. Like, just give me, like, a Final Fantasy XIV colon Estinian. And just, like, I get to play Estinian and play through his journey. I'd, I'd go buy that right now, and I would just burn through it over a weekend. Like a full-blown devil may cry, completely Ooh, absurd, and yeah. then you briefly enter and exit the story with the Warrior of Light. Metal Gear Rising? Yeah, yeah. Think that's a that's a perfect Let's example, right? Give me Metal Gear Rising Estinian Edition, and let me see his whole story play out in order. Yeah, I was so happy to see him coming back. That was I was such a it's such a fan moment, and it's, it's something where I'm really really stoked that I'm playing through this with you. Like that I have someone else here at that moment that Astinian shows up because it's the kind of thing where like if you ever go to these like special screenings of like an anime movie, if you've ever gone to a special screening for a Dragon Ball movie, like when Vegeta shows up, the room loses its collective mind. Like, and that was what this moment was like when Astinian shows up. And it's something, I don't know, it's just like Final Fantasy knows how to wield its characters. It's not always fan service, but when it when it plugs it in, it knows the right time to deploy it, to give you that burst. Like, ah, you're sad, ah, it's war, ah, Conrad died, time for a table read. Let's re-energize you with Astinian. It totally woke me up. It, like, shocked my system and got me back and stoked about seeing where the story was going to go. If Astinian is the B plot, then our C plot, which actually mirrors our own, is R involved. Like he's the warrior of light who didn't become the warrior of light. That could have been the chosen one, but didn't become the chosen one, but is always there. Stormblood is so packed, I completely forgot about R involved's existence. Like in the very beginning, when we get to Girabania, he shows up and they're like, it's a big deal. He survived the attack on the Waking Sands. And I'm like, oh, I, I don't remember you, but cool. I believe what the game is telling me. And then we never see him again until basically the end of 4.0. These characters have lives of their own. What is Estinian doing in the background? Well, naturally, he still has his own personal quest. What's our involved doing? Well, here's where he would be emotionally invested. And you start answering those questions. It's what makes a world actually living and breathing, as the box back might say. It's not because you've put a bunch of trees and some squirrels on them. It's because the characters have their own lives and you're living alongside them. And we head to the Castrum Abanya. It's a mad scientist lab. This is a fun dungeon. It's a great dungeon that no one's disturbed by, which might be the desensitized nature of the world that there's primals and gods and powers and echoes. And yeah, just at this point, they're well, like- we, we already fought a, a Garlean monstrosity at the end of Doma Castle. So we're already aware of the horrible, twisted, 
monstrosities that the Empire is is creating. But that was like power armor. This was like they took a guy and like half melted him and mutated him and then put like exhaust pipes in his back. And they're like, what are these? What does he need for hands? I know motorcycle wheels. <laughs> it was messed up. And then there was like the final boss that was getting like a chemical shower. So his arms would get real big and Bane fight us. And nobody cared. Alphina walks in the room. He's like, good. Where's for Dole? I'm like, D- does anybody see this? This is madness. They'd already seen it. I, I, I disagree. I think the, the final fight at Doma Castle, like that was messed up. He had chainsaws for arms and tubes coming out of his back like some Bane freak show. So I like monsters and I want to I want to explore some monsters. They're some great monsters, the- man. I'm yeah. with you. They, I mean, they, they creep me out, but I, I feel like our character would just be like, oh, she's yeah, more Garlean disgusting experiments. But we take the fight to Fordola's room where she's been trying to get the cannon working again. And this is another new information. It's kind of newish information. We've been building this. We're kind of aware that the echo allows us to see the circles on the ground. But this is where they're really kind of painting it clear. Fordola and her discount echo that she is siphoned off of Kryle is allowing her to predict all the moves of Lise. And then when she engages with Alizé, who uses a very unique fighting style, she's able to predict those moves as well. Like, she's able to see into the future. At least that's how it's expressed here in the story. Now, later on, we learn that this isn't fortune-telling. This is more of a seeing the intent of someone's soul that allows her to one-eye power, half-powered, with the echo. They give us lore that explains why we can see attack signals on the floor. Yeah. They write that into the lore of the world, which they so very much did not have to, but it's not a bad piece of writing. <laughs> like it works. It's weird. To me it seems excessive, but also well executed. <laughs> excessive and well executed might be a really good tagline for Final Fantasy 14. And then she Dr. Robotnik's out of there, jumps on the flying jet and flies away. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. But, so was Dr. Robotnik. But thinking. she's, she's yeah. invincible in that moment. Let's talk about Lise. Uh, Lise has been this the character we've been following through all of Stormblood, even through the, you know, the Eastern Front, which was not a personal journey for her. But, you know, she was there and we're just watching Lise grow and watching Lise develop. It's a slower part, but it really resonated with me. We get we get to take a moment with Raban and Lise out in Garibania. It's, it's the first time that for me, it really like I understood the land and its heritage and how much strife that they've been through and just how war torn and deep seated everything going on in Garibania and how important the loss of Alamigo is to the characters of Raban and Lys, uh, thanks to that that Raban flashback moment that we get. There's a lot of times in Starblood where it feels like, all right, hold on, we gotta take a break. We gotta, we gotta pull the break in the middle of our, our trajectory through the arc. And sometimes, like Ruby C, it kind of annoyed me, except for Susano. But here, I really dug it. I almost think it, like the game almost could have like opened with this. It could have opened with a moment like this between Raban and Lys. That kind of sets the stage of the importance of this and what it means to these characters that we know and maybe some of us love. Lee seems to be a divisive character. I really like her. And by the end of this, I like Lee's a lot. Lisa's story could have been done quicker, but this was more realistic. It's very much like the politics and the war thing going on. Nothing in this game is done quickly. So, like, why would we assume Lee's would be uh, covered in a short amount of time? Well, and Lee's tours Doma with us and gets this showcase of leadership, particularly when she's in the jail cell with Hien, and she finds out that she's still hiding, that she's been hiding behind Papalimo, that she was hiding behind the Warrior of Light, and here she sees Hien, who had to learn that lesson as a boy, and had to become the leader and the man and the confidence, and has these inner fears but can't express them or overcomes them. And so when she returns to the West... Lise brings with her those lessons and she's ready to accept the leadership position. It takes a village to raise a lease. This whole, the whole 4.0 campaign, you know, there's multiple arcs, but a major arc is, is Lise in the company of great leaders. Conrad, Hien, Raoban, 
even, and I mean, just as a scion too, her time spent with folks like Minfilia, but also Alphano, all of these folks that are not afraid to answer the call to lead when it's necessary. And it's also a story about least, like least. Yeah, you said hiding. You didn't mention literally hiding behind the mask of her sister. Like this, this is a person who who has internal conflict and doesn't know who she wants to be. She does, and and it was to me, it didn't really resonate until the very end. To jump ahead for a second, which is she doesn't know if she wants to be an Alamegan or a Scion. And by the end, she decides the path she wants to follow. But to me, that was such a wonderful cap on all of this and made all of like Lisa's entire trajectory make a lot more sense, which <laughs> it's kind of the story of Stormblood. The end of Stormblood really makes everything else just come into focus. Raubon's moment with Lise and talking about that, you know, that essentially mantra of victory or death, it, it feels like the final piece of the leadership puzzle for Lise. That at, after that, after that moment, like she's not questioning herself anymore. She's not questioning if she's the right person to lead these people, if she's worthy of fighting on behalf of her people kind of a thing, because she seems to continually question herself. And it's, you know, perfectly time because it's time to take the fight to Alamigo and the castle itself. And that's expressed in her costuming. All the pieces are coming together. She transformed her Ida outfit Slightly, you know, removed her mask being the biggest point, but that became her lease. And now she takes on the full Alamegan dress. You have a nice little spar up there, which people read into, apparently. People really read into that spar. I really like this because it's it's like, a, to me, the fact that it's, it's her sister's dress, it's a callback to the fact that she used to dress and impersonate her sister. But, uh, it, you know, it's also paying homage to where she came from. She, she tell, you know, she explains the lore behind the dresses. This is a tr traditional Alamegan dress. And she makes it her own. And now she is her own person and ready to be the leader of the resistance. The question going forward is, can she be more than that? But we head across the sultry. Orianje shows up out of nowhere. He does. And he gives us a device so that we can defeat Fordola, but doesn't tell us how it works because going back to new information, the echo sees the intent of your soul. So if we knew how the device actually worked or what it was going to do, Fordola could have gleaned that from our soul and thereby countered it. It was a very cute, you'll forgive me, I love the original run of Yu-Gi-Oh! It was a Pegasus moment and it was fabulous. I love the anti-fortune telling twist, even though it's not fortune telling, it's echo anting. But really this was all about Thancred sharing his character sheet. He's been leveling up out in the dunes. He's got all kinds of skills like 10 minute without breathing and jumping really high and instant kills that he is so desperate to show off. He finally came back to the D&D &D game. He wants everybody to know his level. Yeah, so we uh, we take our Orianje stick with, uh, you know, uh, Echoes of Moonbrita, which he's anytime... going through Moonbrita stuff again. <laughs> <laughs> anytime you bring up Moonbrita, I just get sad. That's, I think, the death that's sticking with me the longest so far. Like, listen, Harshavon was sad, but I really liked Moon Brita. She really woke up a Realm Reborn patch content for me. And I just thought she was such a cool character. <sighs> I was like, ah, oh, hey, new Scion. I, I don't know. I thought she was safe. I'm like, yeah, oh, she's the latest addition to the team. She's going to be with us for a while. And nope, just cut down in her prime, man. Went out like a total badass. Made the noble sacrifice. Kyle, in the future, don't you dare cut this moment of me remembering Moon Brita. Justice for Moon Brita. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, it was I. It was really satisfying to finally uh, take the fight to Fordola and bring it to a conclusion where she doesn't, you know, just escape. And we get a wonderful moment with Lise where she gets this great anime charge up attack. And it was a fun fight too. Like it was. Just it was a fun, a fun fight. Yeah, that was a good fight. It had some good mechanics, uh, well telegraphed things that you needed to get out of the way of. Yeah, it was just a good time. Everything about this was just really satisfying. And with Fordola captured, this, again, builds up, mirrors our eventual final meeting with Xenos. Well, so we, we rescued Kryl, finally. And then we finally get to storm the castle. God, this was satisfying. This was some Lord of the Rings level coming together of all of these characters that you've grown to know, and in my case, the love 
over the course of this expansion and multiple expansions because like everyone is there everyone is there Kyle the PS3 died for this many characters on screen at one time it was great that Pippin got a moment to be the commander he got his dad's sword passed on to him because you know Raban only needs one sword now he got the various guilds and factions all to work together we have a brief side moment with some dogs some wolf, wolf men, men. Don't call them dogs. They are wolf men, sir. Yeah, it was it was a good little character moment for Alpha now, where where his his stratagem, like his strategy brain, his desire for to like minimize bloodshed, it worked. It was a reminder that Doma existed, and when Hien showed up, it didn't seem out of the blue because you went, oh yeah, Hien. He was like he pledged that he was gonna join us in our moment that we needed him, and here he comes. Here comes the airships woo, 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 shooting all their little bullets. And what better to counter them than the exact birds that you saw countering the airship previously. So it worked. And immediately when you see the eagles coming in, you go problem solved. And you get to do a beautiful dungeon. You get to finally enter Alamigo after all this buildup about a land that's worth saving, worth fighting for. You get to see the streets, this prosperous, rich nation. The market stalls are still set up, but the Garlean tech is invaded. And around each and every corner, you get to find an ally fighting. Fantastic visual storytelling. Uh, really reminded me of the, the, like the palace in Dune. High, high praise from me. This came out before the new Dune. I'm talking much, very much the new Dune. Uh, no, you know, no shade on the original. It's very special. But, oh man, yeah, this, this is a masterclass desert palace. It's it's gorgeous. And the way Final Fantasy XIV does dimension in its graphics, if that makes any sense. You know, they come from World of Warcraft. A lot of things are flatter and the textures do a lot more of the heavy lifting. But there was so much craft and care in the three dimensionality of the walls of this dungeon that things as mundane as the floor you were walking on look like a piece of art. Like it was really visually rich um i think doma castle is still the most obscene feast for the eyes i've i've gotten to gaze upon in this game so far but alamigo did not disappoint and the boss fights were great doma castle it builds two story moments and the boss fights were okay and they were kind of robots we had our okay kind of robot to lead this dungeon with the big scorpion he was just fun to fight. What a cool mechanic with his tail attacking at the same time as his front and having to drop out his reticules as he was going to fire the mini missiles. He got to fight the mad scientist in his hover chair while he's being all mad scientist. We did this completely blind too. The language of mechanics here was so impressive. We were removed from our own bodies by flying hands and figured out organically that we had to reach them while dodging the AOEs and cross-section lasers. Yeah, yeah. we never look up dungeons ahead of time and we run them in eye level because we don't want the fights to be over too quick. And that that fight in particular, that was a treat of like, oh wait, what am I supposed to do? Am I, because you're in the dodge things, you can't move very fast and that, that realization that you're tethered to your body and you need to essentially crawl. You're not crawling, I think you're like kind of hunched over, but you essentially need to crawl back to your body to regain consciousness and then like, which is great because I got grabbed by the hand, I think twice. So by the time you regain consciousness, the hands die really fast and it feels super satisfying because for me, I was very annoyed at those hands by the time I got back to my body. This dungeon really felt like an old school beat em up. And to me, that, that's high praise. Like it was a really classical video game experience. Like when, when we're running through the streets and mobs of Imperial guards are jumping over fences to jump at us. Like I felt like I was playing Streets of Rage or Turtles in Time. Like I'm back in the arcade. I'm a kid again. Uh, while still working my way up to the climax of this extremely emotionally nuanced story. Final Fantasy XIV is a great game. Battle with Xenos also had a story to it as well. He kept using the same abilities we had seen many times before. In the very first battle, he does his fire, rage, flame burst thing. Down. You are out. Cutscene plays. Second time you fight him, it hurts a lot. It's like half your health pool. You get pushed back. You have to deal with it. But you're able to take it a little further that time. And Xenos recognizes that as a character and leaves you to grow and foster. Here... You get hit by this multiple times. It is a full-blown 
battle to the end, you get a little hint of mechanics to come even. And how cool to take it to him with a smaller party first, before that final trial, and really be nitty gritty in there with him. There's a great fake out in the cinematic. Like for a hot second, Xenos looks like he's in a bad way. Like staggers, falls down, stabs the sword in the ground. You're like, oh, this must be it. And he's that damn Xenos smile and he just jumps back. And you're like, oh, we're not done with you yet. It's not going to be that simple. And then my meta brain of, yeah, that's right. I went, I beat Heaven's Ward. I remember I had to do a dungeon followed by a trial. I know how this goes. I see you, Final Fantasy XIV. And then we get the massive lore bomb drop. This whole time, Kyle, this whole time, if folks don't watch our live stream, you're watching this YouTube video, that's the way you enjoy our journey through Final Fantasy XIV. Kyle, what have I been yelling? What's the question I've been asking this entire damn time through Stormblood? Where the heck is Shinryu? I think I've just kept saying, where is Omega? Which I by that I meant, where is Shinryu? But yes, <laughs> yes. What the hell's going on with the primal and the, the construct. Uh, well, we don't know what happened to the construct, but we know what happens with Shinryu because that's the big other boot that comes down from Xenos when we head towards the trial, which is, hey, I've got a primal in my backyard. No one could be wrong thinking Stormblood was going to be about finding the primal, seeing the aftermath of the primal and robot battle. It was such a big moment. And then we go off on politics, right? But finally, we have an answer. And it's a super simple answer. It's... Omega netted the primal and Xenos took it to his backyard <laughs> and that's it. He used it as a set piece and Omega crash landed possibly down that big hole. We're still going to find that out. But here we finally find Shinryu. Xenos delivers his big speech. Man should fight for the joy of it. To live, to eat, to breed. Lesser beasts snap and howl at one another for this. Only man has the wisdom and the clarity to embrace violence for its own sake. And this isn't a speech you haven't heard before, but it's done by Xenos. And that's what makes it so special. Like, there are countless movies and stories that do the whole, what's the difference between beasts and man? Man kills for sport. It sounds almost trite that I even break it down that simple. He is in it for the violence. Violence and the pure ecstasy of battle is what elevates you beyond human animal like to godhood. And that's how he sees it. And it was so wonderfully delivered that I was like, you want to be friends? I picked that we want to be friends. <laughs> <laughs> to me, Xenos is a, a delightfully simple villain that offsets the complexity of Stormblood's story. I live for them too. This is who we are, my friend. This is all we are. Uh, he's very s simple, or I might say classical villain in that way. And um, shout out to the English voice acting because Xenos's line reads at the end here, it's, it's some of my favorite voice acting to come out of 14 so far. It's the dude is just drinking the scene and it's wonderful to behold as is this fight. The fight against Shinryu is a feast for the eyes. But first we get our next piece of new information. Oh, you and your new information. Dude, I'm, here I'm for really the excited about this stuff. I'm here for the characters. I know, but this is like, he pulls a reverse Nidhogg. There is another alternative. Or there would be. Had you only mastered your ability? I speak of the Echo, of course. Does it merely render you immune to iconic influence? Or is it rather that your influence is far greater than theirs? Granted, these implications are of no moment to a savage who thinks only of killing the beast before him. He has been infused with this great value Echo, but his is like premium Echo. And he describes to us that it's not that we're immune to enthrallment. It's that our echo, our resonance, is stronger. And before the resonance, the gods shall be made to kneel. And in fact, we might even have, this is my theory, the powers of all a primal that we could enthrall people if we wished. And then he demonstrates this very fact by saying, hey, want to see me do it? And possesses 
Shinryu. He reverses Nidhogg. Nidhogg took control of Astinian. This would be Astinian mind-controlling Nidhogg. And then, like Nidhogg climbed inside of Astinian, Xenos climbs inside of Shinryu. It means that someday we might be able to pilot primals or enthrall others. Or even, huh? Oh, have an army of shells. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how much to read into that though, because they just keep inventing new powers. They just keep escalating it. It's like, oh, uh, Nid- Nidhogg can, can uh, take over Astinian. And it's like, well, is that going to come back or are we just going to escalate from here? And so far, it's just been escalation. It's not a lot of callback. I'm excited because there's a clear lore through line as we go from ability to ability and things keep building on themselves, which means there is a structure to it. It makes sense. Xenos able to control Shinryu, whether or not it was badass and could have just happened because it was awesome. That's great. But it made sense. And that is so satisfying. It's a symphony of flavors. Uh, I didn't read into it at all because to me it felt very sudden and not teed up. And I was okay with it because it's not really what I'm the most interested in. So for me, it was fine. I just, your brain works differently than mine. It also just led to an awesome giant space dragon don't break the ice battle where you had to fight the tail and the big dragon. You got a war, you know, cut Shadow of the Colossus onto the side. It was just satisfying. I don't know if it was easier than Nidhogg, but it was certainly, I think we got carried by our sweet healing team. I died a lot, but our healers were on point. Yeah, I think we got carried through it. Yeah, I want to redo that one because I definitely did not understand the mechanics, but... Um, that was a really cool fight. And right about the time I was thinking to myself, you know, the square platform, it, this fight's cool, but it's no Nidhogg. That's when the active time maneuver happened and they bring you up into the clouds and there's the crystal ether cloud insanity sky. One of the coolest skyboxes I've ever seen in an expansion that is lousy with beautiful skyboxes. It's just bursting at the seams with great artwork. Um, the skybox in the second half of the Shinryu fight. God. <laughs> It's so good looking. It's like the, I feel like a lot of times a game can feel me being like, it's okay. And that's when it goes, oh yeah? Is it just okay? <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's great. I, I really, if you can't tell, I really enjoyed the ending here of 4.0. Xenos at the end has, I think, a perfect ending to that type of character. This, this character that just lived for the fight all Xenos wanted was someone worthy of his battle prowess. And he finally gets it. And he finally gets what he wants. And he's done. He's like, hey. Um, he looks upon what's before him and like realizes there's nothing else for me here. He's such a singular... In, he's so single-minded. He's like a singular force. Xenos killing himself while dark... Uh, demented, uh, messed up. Also, Xeno's just going full unhinged here at the end. Some of the best facial expressions we've seen in Final Fantasy XIV so far. It's a very dark turn for the story. I I I think it's like perfect writing. Farewell, my first friend. My enemy. This is the absolute, like, there's, to me, there's no other ending for Xeno's. I agree. He stole the kill. I felt very empty after this moment. I felt deeply troubled. 100% the right way to write him out. You showcase that you can go beyond his power. That you will continue to grow. We helped him reach that moment of ecstasy he was searching for. And he looked upon the rest of his life and realized that no moment could ever be better than this. And he might as well check out now. Well, I guess you, you kind of echoed Lees because Lees was like not happy with the outcome but it, it's again it's like there's these there were a lot of like sets of two two attacks on the keeps right and one was great and the second didn't go the way we planned and we we fight for Dola and we take for Dola into custody so it goes as we planned but then we fight Xenos and it doesn't go as we planned right so like Lees was in this mindset where well we were able to take for Dola into custody and I want her to face justice and she wanted that for Xenos and was robbed of that. And so you're echoing least there, bud. And they built this up too. everyone when you were going into the castle was like, you kill him dead. You make sure he dies. People like that don't deserve to live. He can't 
be afforded life. And then they take the game takes that from you. They build up that you'll be the one to deliver the final blow. And it's so right that he robs you of that in the final moment. But yeah, it's disturbing. It is. But it's also weirdly satisfying and just solid character writing. And yet there is only joy. Transcendent joy that I have never known. How invigorating, how pure this feeling. You get your victory lap. We've talked about this multiple times. Final Fantasy XIV gives you, the player, your victory lap. It gives you a moment to stop and reflect and enjoy what you've just accomplished. Whereas a lot of other games, not pointing fingers, but a lot of other games kind of just like, oh no, there is another threat. And Final Fantasy XIV does that as well, but not before it gives you your, your satisfying conclusion. And here we are at the end of Stormblood, which is probably the most kind of 100% the game or the expansion or the ex experience of Final Fantasy XIV that comes with the most asterisks is the most opinions from the player base about, hey, it's maybe not the best in the whole series. Uh, you know, everyone's opinion ranges on Stormblood. But to me, Final Fantasy XIV has once again stuck the landing and delivered me a really satisfying conclusion. I like how like classical Star Wars this ending feels. It's very victorious once we get past dealing with Xenos taking his own life. It's maybe even a little hammy with everyone singing, but I, I thought that was such a wonderful capstone because of where we started off, hearing the, the bastardized Garlean version of the Alamegan anthem. It was the right thing to do. You had to showcase to the audience the overwhelming emotion that this victory encapsulated for the people who fought in it. And we walked around, we talked to everybody, and they were talking about how they're crying or holding back tears or how they're overcome with emotion, but they had to showcase that. And in theater, traditional theater, that's what a musical is. It's literally your emotion is so strong you can't help but sing. It overcomes you. You become caught up in the moment. And you got R involved there waving the flag and it kind of pauses and matches the load screen perfectly. It is cheese ball, but I can't think of in a visual storytelling moment how you express that better. And it really, really worked. It earns its traditional heroism, right? Like like after such a, a layered and one might say convoluted, another may say deep, but whatever the case is, the story of Stormblood is nuanced. There's a lot going on. And so it earns these archetypal moments, I feel. In you know a lesser game, it would the whole game would kind of feel phoned in and archetypal. But we we get this ending. Like to me, it feels like a celebration at the end of a Star Wars trilogy or something of that nature, which is something that resonates with me. It's a trope I really enjoy and one that makes me feel heroic and feel satisfied with the ending of a literally in this case going through a terrible war. The real moment of celebration is Gotetsu alive. He's alive. He this, got washed out to sea, ended up on a desert not, island. Not just Gosetsu. No, that is true. Step on me is currently sleeping. <laughs> Can you imagine a more ridiculous odd couple having to share an island? Yotsuyu and Gotsetsu, and Yotsuyu complaining and talking about like how awful things are, and Gotsetsu being like, you must eat of the earth and go fishing with me. Come, let us climb the one tree. It would be perfect, because Yotsuyu's demeanor will roll off of Gosetsu's back like water off a duck. I didn't see this coming. I'm surprised what a happy ending this expansion ended up having. And I'm not going to complain. Gosetsu had a wonderful exit. If that's where he ended, applause, because what a great ending for, for an old warrior that felt like, you know, it was his time. But he's also one of my favorite characters. He's also kind of bummed. Like, now he gets to be one of my favorite comedy tropes, the warrior who can't die. And every time he thinks he's about to have his glorious death, he gets denied it again and again. So we'll absolutely see him again. He's going to end up in full Uncle Iroh territory. He's going to be the old, wizened warrior who is at peace. I think that's where Gosetsu's heading. And then we get Astinian completing his quest, which hopefully means he can rejoin the crew. He's done. He killed the eyeballs, which are much, much smaller now. All drained of their a energy. 
bold decision to have Astinian, like have us check in with Astinian and he does not cross paths with us at all. But I'm so glad that we got to see this and they like they did not forget what brought Shinrio into this world that they're like, Oh, we just, yeah, don't worry. We didn't, you may have forgotten, but we didn't forget that the eyes of Midhog are stuck inside this sucker. I so badly wanted to hang out with Astinian again, but to me again, I think it's this, it's like the sign of good writing. It's not inherently fan fiction. Cause there, I think at times this can feel a little fan ficky cause you are the hero. You are inserted. You are standing amongst greatness with all of the other heroes that we, we fight alongside in Final Fantasy fourteen, And so, to me, I, I really liked that Astinian was just off on his rogue's journey. And then I love the final moments with Lise. Lise formally leaving the Scions, uh, just putting a cap on her story. And like I said, this is where, for me, it really came into focus that Lise was <sighs> living this double life, like, he used to uh, literally live behind a mask and was still metaphorically struggling with you know, am I an Alamegan? Am I a Scion? I'm struggling to focus on both. I'm going to stop focusing on both. And I'm going to make a decision here. And Yishtola was okay. And up walking. So that's good. I'm so glad we got Yishtola Sass before the end of this. I needed just one instance of Yishtola Sass and I was complete. Obviously, there's a big question about what style of government the Alamegans are going to go with. Is least going to be queen or something? But uh, I'm uh, I'm happy to take a break. Like, let's not address that right away. I think I think we can all we all earned a little rest from politics. Let's go. Um, let's go find Omega, and let's do it with the <laughs> with the best couple there is in the game. Sid and Nero back together. Oh, that's right. The lightning, dude, dude. The lightning. <laughs> Nero is. One of my favorite characters, if not my favorite. I love that since the Praetorium, they've really hammed up the Sid Nero troubles. And it is just fabulous. This feels like a damn ending. You're right to bring up the strong ending. Because we dealt with both the Primal Shinryu and Xenos in the same blow. Unlike Heaven's Word, where Nidhogg was still teased out into the future. We address the political struggles with the Garleans, and that's why I feel like going forward, the Garleans are going to get a little more cosmic. They're going to start experimenting with devices and things they shouldn't be doing. This was heavy politics, but grounded in reality for a fantasy. Yeah, I, I feel really satisfied at the end. My gut reaction is I liked Heaven's Ward more, but I think I prefer this over A Realm Reborn. If you enjoy this, make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell. We upload every Wednesday morning, and we stream every Monday afternoon and Thursday evening. Other than that, we're on Twitter, at Garrett Art and at Kyle Ferguson. Until next time, GG. GG.